network to, to be a resource to somebody else. Mm. The best thing you can do is that when you meet somebody new is to say, George, how can I help you? Mm. Because you may, George, may, you may not have something right now, but you, that question is going to resonate with you moving forward. Hello, and welcome to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer. And on today's episode, we are going to be talking to an incredibly experienced facility manager and real estate director. Jerry DeCola is on the show. He is the director of workplace solutions and real estate for AHEAD. And he comes to us with a world of experience in many different aspects. So excited today to talk about facility leadership, how it's changed and where it's headed. Let's get right into this episode. Work Inspired starts right now. Jerry, thank you so much for being here on the show with us today. It's incredibly exciting to have an in-person guest. We do a lot of our recordings remotely and uh, I can't thank you enough for coming in person so we can uh, have a conversation about facility leadership and uh, the current state of the workplace. Great, thank you. George, thank you for the opportunity. It's uh, very unique. I've never done one of these before, so I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. No thank problem. You. Well, let's start with the question we ask all guests. Okay. And that is to give us the Cliff Notes version of your career. Tell us your professional story leading up to what you're doing today. Well, I um, have a, I would call it a checkered background. Mm -hmm. So I, my degree's in HR management. That's where I started. And I started with HR for a number of years. And I was a um, business owner with my wife for a number of years, as well as I was in sales <sighs> before I got into facility management. So if you said, what's your career path? If someone said, how do you get to facility management? I could say, I know the wrong way to do it, but the, <laughs> I, got, I got here along the way. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because on this show specifically, we've talked, we talked to a lot of different roles, but mm -hmm. especially lately, we're really trying to focus in on talking to space leaders and mm -hmm. people leaders. And so you've been both. Correct. Uh, and Correct. obviously being a, a facility manager, a, a, someone who's involved in place, is really making decisions to support people, right? So Correct. it's a good, a good background to have if you are in facility leadership, I think. It is, and I mean, when you think about it, anything we do on a day-to-day -day basis from a facility standpoint impacts everybody, mm. it impacts somebody. Mm -hmm. Whether we make a minor change of moving a rug from here to there, or we change the furniture, or change the office layout, all that will impact someone's life mm. and for that, for that day. And it's important for us to recognize that we have that type of impact and that we need to pay attention to that. We never should be doing things just simply because we want to do it, mm -hmm. but there has to be an understanding. So yeah, cool. And I want to go back to, I mean, to the original question. I mean, I've been for, very fortunate for a lot of, have I've had a lot of experiences, but I've also had a lot of great, great mentors. When mm -hmm. you talk about leaders, mm -hmm. I've had a lot of great mentors, people who have supported me through thick and thin um, from a company standpoint. And I've been very blessed with a wife of 30 years who has been through it all with me and has, uh, has, see, has helped me a great deal. Very cool. And you're also very proactively progressing your career. I, we were joking that before we started, but CFM, FMP, SFP, FMA, Pro mm -hmm. FM, Lead GA, you've got so many accreditations. You're clearly uh, continuing education, a student of, of your profession. Um, I think that's remarkable in of itself that you're, you're always see probably, I mean, based off of these accreditations, it seems like you're not never stopping learning or adding to your skill set and knowledge. Absolutely. I mean, that's a thing of a huge part of my success has been the educational part mm -hmm. and all those accreditations means that I've learned something along the way. I know that I'm not the, uh, I don't have experience in a lot of er a lot of areas. I'm also an instructor. So mm -hmm. as a professional instructor for facility management, those accreditations help me. Mm -hmm. It kind of gives me credit when I walk into the room. But I know there's people in that room who are my students or my participants who are a lot smarter in some areas than I am. And it just, this kind of gives me, gives me in the background. It's a huge part of how I've been successful over the last 20 years. And that is something we have learned as we've gone through many, many conversations on this show is especially when it relates to mentorship, but even with continued edu education, it's a two-way street. When you mentor someone, you're also learning from them, right? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. So. And even classes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one that I mentioned, I started on HR. So a big part of my HR career in the beginning was employee relations and mm -hmm. recruitment. And I never lost that skill for talking to people and to doing interviewing with people. And so teaching is using that skill. Mm -hmm. And so 
a lot of my interaction with students is just an interview mm -hmm. and to talk, get them to embrace, to come out of their shell. Um, the best thing you can do as an instructor, I mean, you always have the people in the room who kind of sit back and just put their hands on their chest and mm -hmm. like, I'm not talking to you. I'm, not, I'm here because I have to be. But if I can break through and get them to engage, those are some of the best stories that come mm -hmm. in through those classes. Very cool. And especially relevant today. I mean, as there's, we, this podcast started right as the pandemic started. And over the last two and a half years, we've experienced so much change. And things are certainly different than they were before 2020. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into that. But let's start, let, let, let's, let's, uh, let's kind of set the stage. What, what are you doing now? Tell me a little bit about AHEAD, the organization you're currently with. Sure. What makes AHEAD different? What do you guys do? What's the way of working currently? That kind of thing. So AHEAD is an, I, I, it's an IT integration company, and we're much bigger than that. And it's funny, when, you, when I talk to people who work for AHEAD, I have to actually ask them to explain to me as if I'm a second grader as to what they, what they do, mm -hmm. because I'm the, the facilities and real estate person. I mean, they, they take care of a lot of large organizations mm -hmm. from hardware, software, consulting, maintenance uh, standpoint, um, they do a lot for their clients from, mm -hmm. from beginning to end. I don't think there's any other companies that I'm aware of that provide the same type of services that we can do from end, from end to end. But this, and they've grown mm -hmm. tremendously mm -hmm. over the last uh, three to five years. But they haven't forgotten where they came from. Mm -hmm. uh, the leadership is very approachable, uh, very uh, they engage, they're engaged with their, with their employees. There's no ivory towers. Even though we have a headquarters in Chicago, um, the people who are there, I mean, they're in the same desk that we are. There's no offices in our spaces. We're a completely open desking space in our, in our headquarters. And so I'm in a desk and 10 feet away from me is the CEO, mm. the CIO, and the, you know, and the HR direct uh, chief as well. So there's no, there's no pretentiousness that goes on with the, with the head. Great, great people who are masters in what they do and have done a tremendous job of growing the, the company. I think about four or five years ago, there were about three or 400 employees. We're now up to over 1,500 employees. Wow. And continue to grow, and plans to continue to grow as well. Are the majority of those employees working in the office? Is it a hybrid approach, remote? What's the... Most like? of them are, uh, it's actually kind of a combination of both. Okay. So we're remote and hybrid. Um, they, I would say there's a lot of offices that are not being occupied as much mm -hmm. as, they use, as they used to be. Um, we are kind of actually kind of going through the process right now to kind of figure out what the policies and procedures will be from a hybrid standpoint. The organization has, is looking at its hybrid approach. Mm. We are looking to see what we can do to, re, to make sure our employees are engaged, to work and, where we, and connect with them where they are. Okay. Right? You don't have to be in an office to be able to connect with the employees. It's an important part. It's a part of our mission. It's a part on our website mm. that we connect with people where they, where they are. Is it ideal for people who can come in? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be mm -hmm. able to talk to someone in, you know, face to face like this, mm -hmm. have a cup of coffee with them or just pass them in the hallway and say, I've got a question for you is a huge opportunity for many companies. And you're in a situation where you're at a high growth company. You just talked about pretty impressive, you know, skyrocketing growth and number of employees and mm -hmm. continued plans to do so. How, from a facility leadership perspective, do you balance that? Because you're you're trying to identify what the need is in, in the workplace in mm -hmm. a hybrid model. Um, but you're also growing very quickly and adding people to the organization. So right. how do you determine how much space you need? It, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And I would say if I had the right answer, I would be the most important person in part of head, but mm -hmm. I, it's still, it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have the, I don't have the answer. I, I've been only with them for uh, close to five months mm -hmm. now. And so I'm, we're uncovering things. I'm uncovering how people operate. I'm covering which offices are more, more populated, better populated. I'm uncovering what the pol best policies and procedure will be from ahead. It's vastly different from where I came from. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, from, I came from the pharma and legal environments, um, gr different industries, different approach, different ways of, of uh, managing their spaces. Mm -hmm. And obviously with COVID, you know, it obviously has changed everything as well. So we are continuing to look. I don't have the answer. A year from now, I'll come back and I'll tell you what the answer is. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's helpful that you sit very close to some of the decision makers, right? right. So that you guys can constantly, constantly be evaluating. Mm -hmm. How, what are some of the ways that you are trying to collect the right information? Are you using space utilization software? Are you 
monitoring kind of days in the office? Are you tweaking policies? What are some, because I think we there's are, probably a lot of people in your boat, right? Like, right. We are, I, util, yeah. we are, we are uh, kind of tracking how many people in the, in the mm -hmm. office from a, a utilization standpoint. And mm -hmm. that's driving a lot of the, the uh, decision-making as to which offices are expanding, which offices are contracting and which office may be closed over the, over the next year or so. Sure. You talked about your background in HR and that you also sit pretty close to the HR team at Ahead. Mm -hmm. Are, is the decision-making process and the conversations between real estate or facilities and human resources, is it closely intertwined now because of the policies and because of some of the changes that were brought about by COVID or is it more like, well, is it still fairly separated and segregated? No, it's definitely integrated. And mm -hmm. I would say I would expand beyond HR. It's, it also expands to IT, mm -hmm. to IT mm -hmm. security, obviously to leadership. It, it kind of it, it touches everybody. And being kind of an IT services company, are you guys packaging up some best practices for the IT approach to the hybrid workplace? Because certainly that is a hot topic right now. Actually, that's kind of a hand in hand. We're yeah. doing that. We're, at the same time, we're figuring out what to do from the real estate standpoint. We're kind of working through it from an IT security standpoint mm. as well. All right, cool. You've had, obviously, this long, successful career um, in facility leadership, and it dates back much earlier than the pandemic, but there's right. also been other crises that we've all, you know, some Correct. of us have weathered depending on how long we've been in the professional world. What's changed? What are some of the most notable things that have changed between, and I know you've switched between different industries. So mm -hmm. certainly some of those things are company type or industry type, but as, from a facility management perspective, and when you talk to your colleagues or peers and some of these groups, what have you seen as some of the major tangible changes that have happened as it relates to that profession? Well, a few things. When I, when I first started 20, almost 20 years ago, there was all those certifications you just talked about, mm -hmm. they didn't exist. Oh. So only one, uh, only one of them had, was, was uh, around at that time and um, back in 2005. So the FMP, the SFP, the Pro-FM, they were all brand new. Mm. So there's a, a greater, um, uh, there's, it's recognized that there's a greater need and delivery of, of those types of certifications. So we actually, obviously there's more people who are certified. Which means that when they become certified, it means that they are engaged in their profession. They have, they, they're showing a deeper sense of critical thinking and system thinking. So I think the FM before was someone who usually came up from the boiler, uh, boiler room or, mm -hmm. the, or they were the executive admin who be, got thrust into facility management. And now you're looking at a profession that actually has some credibility. Um, actually, it was until 2018 that the facility management title mm. was actually recognized by the government really? as a real as a real job huh. so we didn't really exist as a from a, a, a governmental standpoint until 2018 wow so i think the education the types of people who are coming aboard we, you know, a lot of people with very backgrounds uh, it hr operational and there's more people who have degrees in facility management mm. there was back when i started there was only one school one notable school and that was fair state uh, who actually had a facility management program. There are now multiple universities who are offering facility management degree programs. Um, people can actually get a master's in facility management that, that, that didn't exist 20 mm. years ago. And I think as a profession, we're, we're, because of that, we have more opportunities to be able to demonstrate that we're, a bit, we're more than just, yes, we understand the chillers. Mm. Yes, we understand the operations of the, of the organization. Yes, we're great at um, buying office products, but there's so much more that we can offer the mm. organization. Sustainability, critical thinking, system thinking, being a, a, a partner with senior leadership that we weren't 20 mm. or some years ago. Yeah, it's interesting. We just did a, we, oh, I just wrote a script. We haven't done the video yet about what is a facility manager. Mm. And I was on the IFMA website. And I think, was it, is it nine pillars? There's a number of, like, there's all these different buckets and you just listed off a couple of them. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, yeah, wow, that's a lot to know, you know, and you could specialize in any single one of those and make a whole career out of it. Right. So Absolutely. like, are you seeing the, the role of the facility manager now, especially a legitimized role as, by, mm -hmm. as since 2018, is it a, is it a generalist that needs to know a little bit about everything because it touches so many parts of the business? Or are you seeing people that are also kind of specialized in certain areas um, where maybe there's a team of facility managers that, that each one does a little bit, something unique. So it, uh, um, I think it depends on the organization. Mm -hmm. So in very large organizations, there are a lot of people are very specialized okay. in procurement or operations or from a real estate standpoint. 
I, I've always worked for companies that are mid, small to mid sizes. Mm. So, I be, so from my standpoint, I have to be a generalist. Mm. But, you know, so I guess there's a combination of both, depending on the on the size of the organization. I think people who have a varied background can actually integrate better, right? Because if you're just specialized in one particular area, you don't. It doesn't lend itself to be able to communicate your. As I mentioned before, facility management, when mm -hmm. we changes, mm -hmm. when we make changes or do anything, mm -hmm. we're touching someone else's life for that particular day. Mm -hmm. And if we don't recognize that and see that, and we're only focused on our segment, mm -hmm. um, we don't we don't perform at our best. Mm -hmm. we, we can't we can't be seen as the partner because we're not recognizing what other people have to bring, other people need or bring to the table. Sure, sure, that makes sense. You think safety, security, well being, sustainability technology and the internet, the smart buildings, mm -hmm. um, the idea of just how much space do we need and the footprint of real estate, you right. know, which of them are kind of top of mind for you right now? I would say, um, I, I mean, security is always as top of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously during the pandemic, operational cleanliness and mm -hmm. operation procedures was, was a, a, a big point. Um, I think flexibility right now mm. is the, is the key word for us. Mm. You know, it's, it's no one knows the answer as to how much space we're going to need, but to be able to build in flexibility, whether it's through furniture or design or through real estate tra transactions, flexibility is a huge part of what facility management has to be able to deliver. Mm. Because you, first of all, in you mentioned that, you know, there's been changes throughout the years. I mean, 2008, 2009, I lived through that part. And there were a lot of companies that went on to business or mm -hmm. they were giving back spaces. And so you have to be able to be flexible. And yeah, management yeah. come up to you anytime and say, okay, we're going to just cut, we need to cut 10% off of your budget. Mm -hmm. What are you going to, what ideas do you have? You better have some things that you can rattle off sure. a couple, right from the top because you can't be saying, well, let me get back to you in six months mm -hmm. because in six months things have changed again. Mm -hmm. What are some of the best ways that you work flexibility into the plan? Is that, I mean, like I, does, does, does it, does it depend on the, the type of building? Like if it's an older building that's been retrofitted or if it's a new building that's got more amenities, is it more about the type of furniture that you select or the, the design, or you talked about being free address or unassigned? Mm -hmm. What are, what are some things that are working as it relates to increased flexibility today well, i guess all i guess all the above yeah. i think i think design is a huge is a huge part of mm -hmm. it right because i mean for you know while that we we went through the pandemic mm -hmm. you know we still have leases right and for those headquarter leases sometimes they're 10 and 20 years yeah. and, to, and we don't have an opportunity to to get out of them i mm -hmm. mean there's not unless there was a unless when someone saw 10 years ago when they got into it to build an exit clause that just in case of pandemic then they, you know, there's they have those properties, and it's yeah. gonna they're gonna gonna have that for quite some time. Subleasing space is an is an opportunity, but of course, there's a lot of people are gonna be putting market stuff mm -hmm. on the on the market. So, so that's gonna be more become more challenging. So, I think it's continuously looking for opportunities, and and when you look for opportunities, you can't just look at the your own industry. Look mm -hmm. at what other industries are doing. Mm -hmm. What is you know what is the food service industry doing? What is the furniture industry doing? What's the technology industry doing? To see how they're making changes because you can find answers someplace else. You may not be in the facility management mm. um, bubble. Bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. Are, are you? We we've talked to a number of wallet holders or decision makers, people that are shaping policy at organizations, and it seems because of some of the benefits that you mentioned earlier that there's a there's a uh, for a lot of organizations, there's a desire to get their teams back into the workplace to some perspective. Correct. But I think one of the challenges is that, because, especially because of the talent market right now, it's we can't force it back. Mm -hmm. we, we want we need them to want to come back. Right. Is that something that you're dealing with? Have, do you have any advice as to good ways to get people to say yes, I want to come to work today and not stay in my bedroom? No, I don't <laughs> have. Tough, I don't have. It? I don't have a good answer. I mean, there are some companies like um, um, Google mm -hmm. and Apple. They have announced that mandates. You know, some yeah. mandates, and I think once they start to do it, some of the small, some of the smaller players will be be able to get behind that. So, mm -hmm. I think from that standpoint, the industry is is picking up and saying, "We want you. We want you back." Yeah, and I think. Um, I think. As managers, we need to recognize when that's necessary. So it may not be that we have to be in together with five days a week, but there may, three days a week may make sense mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a part of our life for, for quite some time. And you talk about flexibility too. And when you were referring to it, it's flexibility in how the space is able to change to meet the needs of the business. Right. But also obviously one of the benefits of flexibility is meeting the needs of the people. 
And that's one thing that's going to keep people at your organization and potentially hopefully allow them to find a balance between it. Remote and in person. Right? Yeah, it's gonna, yeah. you're going to have to keep, cha- keep making changes and, tra- and to understand what's bring, bringing people in. Mm. Many times it's training. Yeah. Many times yeah. it's collaborative environment. Many times it's the annual or quarterly meeting that's mm. going to bring them into into the office. It may not, and they're. It's up to the individual manager, not just the organization, to say, "I haven't seen my, some of my team for quite some time. Let me figure out how to get um, some different." ways of collaborating. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be just placed on the organization as a whole. I think managers have to be able to look at their own teams and understand what they need mm-hmm. and make sure that one, they're hiring the right people. Cause if they're hiring people who need to be in the office, but they only, those people only want to work remote, maybe that's not the right person for your organization. Um, and it's off, it's a combination of both. It's an HR perspective. It's a facility standpoint. It's an IT perspective. Mm-hmm. I haven't figured out how to make my my spaces, better looking than what the bedroom looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think part of it too, is the, the idea of culture, right? And culture has been a a topic in our industry for so long, Mm -hmm. but an organization that's got a strong workplace culture, which is really interactions between people. I Mm -hmm. mean, the space contributes to it, but it's the people, you know, I I think that ultimately that's probably going to be one of the biggest drivers of getting people back in because even, you know, until we get, we talked a little bit about meta before the call, but like mm-hmm. until the virtual experience emulates this, the in-person mm-hmm. experience, there's still value here. You're still That's isolated true. when you're on a screen. And so I, hopefully we can continue to draw off of that to get people back together, at least to some extent. You know, it's, I think it's some part of it's generational too, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Because I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, when I started with the head, I was, uh, I was used to being in the office five days a week, mm-hmm. even during throughout COVID. So it's a different, if it's a different environment for me as well, right. as well. So it's something that we all have to get used to. Well, let's talk about that. I was going to skip a question, sure. but let's talk about the generation and the diversity of gen- uh, of generational um, perspectives. So I, I, I don't have the statistic, but I've, I've seen numerous headlines that say there's more generations at work today than there has ever been in the past, right? Right, right. What has your experience been as far as catering to and um, suffice, <laughs> I, making everybody happy, basically? <laughs> right. I, I've seen the same article. So, so I've seen articles where it's, they've talked about five different generations mm-hmm. being in the industry at the, or in the workplace at the same time. And I think um, I think a lot of it is focused on what makes us different, mm-hmm. as opposed to what makes us this, what makes us t- the same, mm-hmm. right? Um, I know. I mean, if we ha- if you have a work ethic and you're my age, or you have a work ethic when you're just starting out, it it doesn't make it doesn't make a difference. Mm-hmm. So, my standpoint, I know what my limitations are. I know as a ba- as a baby boomer that what I bring to the table, I bring the experience and the knowledge and t- and years and years of experience. Do I, am I the strongest technology person? No. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do I recognize and respect my my younger peers who do have that? Yes, of course. And I have no problem asking for help when when needed and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, mentoring those people, helping them get through the experiences. I think we should be celebrating the differences as opposed to saying, you know, these Gen Xs do this and the millennials Mm -hmm. do that and the Mm -hmm. babies do boomers do this. I mean, there's, there's opportunities and, and there's benefits to all five of us being in the, in the room at the same time. Yeah, that's a really good point because I think there's, there's ways to look at diversity and say, this is a great thing. It's, different. it's, it's, a, different, it's a variety of perspectives, right? right. Or experiences or, um, or times in our careers or in our lives where we can all bring in our own kind of point of view mm-hmm. and we can make a better decision because of it. Right. And then at, on, the, on the flip side of that, there's also, there's a human quality right so right. like i've heard that um younger people might want to might not want to be coming into the office because they're they they change or adapt faster and they mm-hmm. got used to it during the pandemic i've also heard that people who are more senior in their careers have said all right well i'm i've done i've i've paid my dues i've mm-hmm. done the you know like the community in the eyes so but on the flip side i've also heard the complete inverse where and i experienced this personally was Early in my career, for about five years, I was remote, and I did enjoy the benefits of being able to do whatever I wanted. I had mm-hmm. the drive, but I realized after about four years how isolating that was, and I didn't have in-person mentors. I wasn't getting the training and development. And then, like we just talked about earlier, there is a perspective where someone who is a mentor gets mentored by their mentoree, right? right so there's a two-way right. learning. And so right. I think it's just the way we communicate the value of being together 
it can transcend generations, right? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, as a, as a manager and I mentioned as an instructor, that's my, t- that's my style of, of engaging with people anyways, mm-hmm. is through mentorship and, t- and through training. And I'd rather sh- you know, rather show you something than to, to do something on your, on your behalf. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people who helped me through the way, through my career. And I want to do the same thing. It's mm-hmm. time for me to be able to give back to those people who are coming up, up and coming. Very cool. Uh, we diversity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are other, those are top of mind, big topic themes right now. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about generational diversity. When you're putting together a team or w- looking to work effectively with the team as it relates to, to diversity, what are, what are kind of some of the kind of the key ingredients that, that, that are important to you? Well, when I think, when I think about, first of all, when I'm t- putting a team together, mm-hmm. the first thing that I'm looking at, I mean, job description is, is important, of course. But the first thing that I recognize is that I bring certain qualities to the, to the team. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't want me on the rest of the team. I, so I need to figure out what, my, what deficiencies right. I, right. I have and identify where that can bring, I can fill those holes um, with other people, regardless of who they are, where they come from. If they can fill those holes that I don't have or that I'm not capable of, of developing, um, those, that's where it starts from mm-hmm. my standpoint. And then it's looking for the best talent, regardless of where they come from, what their background is. I think it's not only diversity, it's also inclusion and engagement, mm-hmm. right? So I've seen a lot of organizations who use diversity as a check the box right. or it's on their website. Um, I've se- I worked for an organization a number of years ago where they recognized that they were, their diversity program was not up to par. And so they made, made a pu- big push to hire people uh, from different backgrounds. So they did the things from a diversity standpoint, but they failed to identify the engagement part mm. and the inclusion part. And the, the, all the effort they put into in f- over a year's time to bring all these people with diverse, diverse backgrounds into it, they didn't, they failed to connect to those people. Mm. They failed to have an opportunity to engage with those people. And a year later, 75% of those people, it was probably about 20, 25 people who were hired are gone. Mm. They went to other organizations. Mm-hmm. They went to they went to organizations where they could feel more comfortable mm-hmm. and they were getting get the recognition. So I think it's a big part of it. It's not just to check the box. You have to take the next step of it, of engagement and um, inclusion. Mm. I'll give you one other example. So um, when I was with my last employer, uh, we started I've always been a big proponent of hiring people with disabilities. Mm. And um, we were growing fast, and I, and my goal was to hire some, bring some people in with uh, disabilities to work in our our mail room. And we hired a young man and um, brought him in, and he we failed him because we didn't t- take the steps or the time to really have everything in place to make sure that he was engaged, he had the training he needed, and that we were connecting with him. And I didn't have the right manager. I didn't have the right support system. And we failed him. Hmm. Second time around, we stepped, We figured that out. We realized what we needed to bring people in with those types of backgrounds, what training they necessary, what, what connections they needed, what support did they need. Hmm. And we ended up, when I left the organization, we had six people with the, with the disability who were working for our organization because we took the time to figure out how to engage and mm. how to connect them. And it wasn't just a disability. Uh, in, you know, I didn't hire them because they had a disability. I was looking to be able to make sure that I had an opportunity. I had the opportunity to offer them the opportunity to someone with disability mm. to come aboard. And I wanted to make sure those people would succeed. It's good advice too, because without having have had, I mean, you had the intention. Right. And you actually acted on that. Mm-hmm. But without that experience of, the first failure, you may not have been able to create a successful program for the, for the second round, for right. where, when it did work. So right. I think that's great advice, learning from, you know, m- intent and then action, but then ob- ability to actually learn from it and be open to changing it around, to making it work, right? right. So I, 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 I think that's, that's great. Um, I, I've heard over and over again, and I've, again, more statistics, but it seems that engagement levels, especially in the last two year, couple of years are at almost lo- all time lows. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if uh, that we've fully identified the reason why mental health, maybe the pandemic, some of the issues in the world. Mm-hmm. I think a big chunk of it personally is 
the isolation of being remote. Right. Um, and maybe a less defined line between personal and professional lives. Mm -hmm. Um, but what are some of the ways that, uh, you know, in, and I think diversity and the inclusion piece of it are certainly helpful to promoting engagement. Right. But when it comes to engagement, what are some of the ways that you can promote it, that you can increase it, that you can even measure that it, you know, at your own organization or within your, your own team, how is it, you know, what, where are we at? I guess to start with as a manager, I need to, if I, if I'm, you're just coming aboard, I need to talk to you and find mm -hmm. out what you need from me mm -hmm. as a manager. What kind of interaction do you want? I mean, it's, it's a part of our, in, our ongoing orientation that we have at ahead where that we have, um, you know, weekly or 30 day, um, meetings with our, all of our employees. And it's part of our, in, our initial interviewing process is to understand what do you need from me? Mm -hmm. And it's not just what can I give to you, but I need to understand what you, what it's going to drive you to be engaged. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may be the kind of person who said, I like to do you know, heads down and I'll check with you when I need help. And that's, type, that's how my engagement should be with you. Mm -hmm. You may either be the kind of person who is, um, needs uh, day to day connection, responsibility, a lot of ad, um, kudos and attaboys. And that's up to me to be able to say, okay, I recognize that this person needs more than what, I, what the other person is, is necessary. So, on ground level, that's where I, it needs to begin. So, if I'm, I'm going to go back to a management standpoint, organizations be able to support managers to be able to have the, the ability to flex between different types of uh, um, people who are working for the organization. Mm. So that's a part of it. Creating opportunities. Uh, when people are in the office, you know, is it, you know, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we, my last organization, we had um, ping pong tables in our lunchroom and they were collecting dust. Mm. And we decided, I decided, we decided as a team, let's have a tournament. Mm -hmm. And nothing fancy, and we gave away twenty five dollars gift cards, so mm -hmm. they weren't bringing anything. And we had more fun and more engagement and more activity. We had one of my team members never played. He mm -hmm. joined the tournament because he and he now loves the game and <laughs> teaches other people how really? to do it. <laughs> and it's because we we did something. We took something that was just there, mm -hmm. and we we changed it to make it more more inviting. Mm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is good communication and un understanding that not everybody's different and trying to encourage on the manager, the manager level mm -hmm. to be able to, um, promote or encourage engagement based off of really understanding each individual. Right. And then also as an organization, creating opportunities where engagement is possible or where it can be cultivated. Right. And that doesn't have to be some massive expensive endeavor. Mm -hmm. You can get creative, do something a little different, just change things up. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's Very right. cool. Yeah. We talked earlier about how an investment in a place is an investment in people. Um, you know, obviously we specialize in workplaces at BOS and it's mm -hmm. something that you've been very close to your whole career or most of your career. Um, talk about a little bit about from your experience, the relationship between a workplace and its benefit on people at an organization. Well, I, I keep going back to what I said before: is what we as as a facility management professional, what we do, how we design it, how we maintain it, mm -hmm. is uh, very important because it it affects when you come to and come in. If you come into a space that is dark, dingy, dirty, mm -hmm. um, what's your what's your focus on it? it but keeping yourself sanitized mm -hmm. from your own workspace. Mm -hmm as opposed to walking into a space that's bright and inviting and um, well-maintained and you feel safe and secure, you know, now I've eliminated that component. Now you can, you know, if you use Maslow's theory, I've, I've taken care of the first level. Now we can start to move you up to the next level of self-esteem mm -hmm. and be able to engage with people. So I think a lot of what the workplace, the workplace has to do is to offer safe and security and an inviting place, right? Mm -hmm. So a place where I can sit down with you and have a cup of coffee or have a conversation with you. Opportunities for us to, enga to engage. And, to create spaces where, you know, accounting only stays here and finance only stays here, um, doesn't provide engagement. Mm. Doesn't provide those opportunities for people to cross connect and be able to uh, get to know each other. Mm. Facility manager of 2027, five years from now. Mm -hmm. Does it look the same as it does today? Is this no. pace of change going to continue, accelerate? Yeah. It's going it's to continue to yeah. change, yeah. right? I think technology is going to be a, a big, even bigger part between smart buildings and uh, 
whether we were hoteling or we're doing, as you mentioned, the med, the meta universe, um, we're going to have to figure out how that integrates. I mean, I don't think buildings are going away and I don't think spaces are going to, I think they're just going to change. Mm. I think that back in 2008 and 2009, when people, all the companies were going out of business, that was, you know, one of the things we kept reading is the, off, the modern office building is going away. Mm. It didn't go away. Mm -mm. It just changed. Yeah. It morphed into into something else. And I think the same thing is going to continue after this situation too. Well, we'll be uh, eagerly following your your progress, <laughs> especially from the IT perspective and how that's all integrated, right? right. So, um, let's let's end with a couple questions that can be either personal or professional. Sure. But uh, I think in twelve months, next year, what's something you're looking forward to? Well, I'm looking forward to a lot more opportunities to be. Uh, engaged from an instructor standpoint. Oh, cool. So a lot of, over the last couple of years, a lot of the classes that I had were canceled, mm -hmm. right? Or mm -hmm. they went virtual. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually looking for, in a couple of weeks, I'm doing one of my first in-person instructional training class um, uh, in, on real estate. So I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to being able to talk to people and be able to read their faces and not just see them behind a com computer screen. So if that's, for me, that standpoint. I'm hoping to be able to meet some more of my colleagues, mm -hmm. right? So I'll be able to tra travel more over to the different, we have over 20 offices. So to meet more and more people throughout, throughout that. Um, so that's a big, that's a big part of it as well. Cool. As it relates to resources mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I'm sure there's been many throughout your career, especially mm -hmm. with all the training and the knowledge, what's something that you could recommend to others as that's been valuable to you? Education, education, education. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I tell, I've told the story a million times. It, you know, it, it's when I started as a facility manager, I knew three things. I knew I was getting better pay, better pay, better benefits, and had better hours. The one thing I didn't know, I had no idea what a facility manager did. <laughs> and it's only through my engagement with IFMA and education. It's one of the reasons why education has been a huge part of my career is because that's been my success story is mm -hmm. because I learned things along the way. Mm -hmm. And I, whether it's relative to your current employer, it may, be, may not be. It may be relative to the next employer. I know I've gone through a couple of different, I've worked at a couple of different companies. A lot of the interviews that I've gone through over the last 10, 15 years, people have focused more on my training and my certifications than they, than they do asking questions about how much knowledge I have about a chiller because they have the assumption that I have the training, I have the certification, and guess what? If I don't know, I, can, I have the resources to find it. Very cool. And if someone's interested in facility management or if they already are in facility management and want to continue to, to, you know, advance their, their knowledge. Is IFMA a good hub? Is that a good place? IFMA is a great yeah. pub. Yeah. And yeah. so there's another organization called Pro FM. Pro FM. Yeah. It's also there. They both have great programs from a facility management experience. So either one of those um, will, they have a different approach, but the information is the same. Mm. We talked about mentorship mm -hmm. a couple of times. Um, final question. If, if, uh, if you were retiring tomorrow, and you were mentoring somebody, what's uh, some words of wisdom you would leave them with? I would say network, network, and network again, <laughs> but now network to build your LinkedIn profile mm. or your Facebook or Instagram or whatever else that you may have. Network to, to be a resource to somebody else. Mm. The best thing you can do is that when you meet somebody new is to say, George, how can I help you? Mm. Because you may, George, may, you may not have something right now, but you, that question is going to resonate with you moving forward. Mm. Um, I, I didn't realize I was doing it on a informal basis. I, for the last, before I joined ahead, I met a, a person named Larry Kaufman who has a book on networking. And it was, it, what I was doing was actually in the book. Oh, yeah. not, and it, it really does resonate. If you start to offer opportunities to help other people, that comes back tenfold when you when you're networking so not just networking to be a nice guy and be known by more people but mm. actually be adding value to people correct that's going to be the best way to do it right. well that's great well i can't thank you enough for all the insight and thank you. the um the inspiration it's it's great talking to someone as accomplished as you and uh and to be able to learn from you is a privilege so thanks for being on the show thank you thank you appreciate the opportunity thanks george yeah. take care Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired.
Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.